Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Please be seated for the lesson. Why should you be like someone confused, like a mighty warrior who cannot give help? Yet you, O Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us. Thus says the Lord concerning your people. Truly they have loved to wander. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. Have you completely rejected Judah? Does your heart loathe Zion? Why have you cut us down so that there is no healing for us? We look for peace, but find no good. For a time of healing, but there is terror instead. We acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord, the iniquity of our ancestors, for we have sinned against you. Do not spurn us. For your name's sake. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Can any idols of the nations bring rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Is it not you, O Lord our God? 
we set our hope on you, for it is you who do all this. The word of the Lord. from the second letter to Timothy. I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have found good, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them, but the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord.
gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the table, a temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, rogues, thieves, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his own justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Gospel of our Lord. From the epistle reading, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. For the last several weeks, we have been journeying through the epistles to Timothy. These are a group of letters which also includes the epistle to Titus, so 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. These are a group of letters that are ascribed to the Apostle Paul. Of late, there has been plenty of scholarly conjecture about whether or not Paul wrote 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. The purpose of a homily is not to delve into all of those things. So if you want to argue with me about Pauline authorship of those three epistles after the service, you are free to do so. But for the purposes of this homily, let's undertake the tradition of the church, which has been that Paul wrote them. If that is the case, Paul is writing this last letter to his protege, Timothy. He is in, pris in prison in Rome. Paul knows he's not getting out of that predicament alive. Tradition holds that Paul was probably martyred in Rome somewhere between 64 and 67 in the common era. So Paul is awaiting the inevitable. And while the letters to Timothy have been letters about church order, the discipline of bishops, how people are supposed to behave in community, the qualifications of clergy and leaders, while it's been all of that as sort of getting things situated, in the back, or maybe even the forefront of Paul's mind, is what is about to happen to him. And so we get to the end of this letter, and Paul is musing about his ministry, and he utters, writes those words. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. It's quite a journey that Paul has been on, a journey of a lifetime. He has been a prisoner 
to the faithfulness of Jesus and to the message of the good news of the resurrection. Ever since the resurrected Lord appeared to him on a vision, in a vision on his way to Damascus. And so Paul had set out evangelizing the entire known world. Places like Ephesus and Colossae and Corinth. Places like Athens and Thessalonica. Paul had been on the road his entire ministry as an apostle. And just to keep in mind, when Paul came rolling into town, at most there might be a handful of followers of Jesus. There weren't any church buildings. There wasn't any structure. This preacher rolls into town and starts proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, arguing in the synagogues, and invariably either getting stoned or kicked out of town or put in jail. Faithful to the call that he had received. I've gotten a little bit tired of a cliche that has been making its way around the Episcopal Church since probably the early 2000s. It was sort of formulated as we began to grapple with the ongoing decline of the main line. As we began to grapple with shrinking persons in worship, shrinking numbers of people in worship, less and less participation in the life of the church, as we began to deal with the realities of churches having to close, as we were dealing with the fact that we were shedding members by the thousands, someone thought of this great little cliche. God never called us to be successful. God called us to be faithful. May I just say that I never understood why one couldn't be faithful and successful? Why are those terms mutually exclusive? And it feels like as we've made our way through the pandemic, we have doubled down on this. We have doubled down on faithfulness as a rationale for why we are struggling. Why there is a lack of energy, why there is a lack of participation, why people are more absent than present, why we continue to struggle in all sorts of ways as the church makes its way through this next chapter. And I, truth in advertising, I am sick to death of that cliche. And you know why I'm sick to death of it? It's because we seem to think that by putting this mantra over it, we are absolved of any responsibility to make things better. You want to know what a faithful witness to Christ looks like? It doesn't look like passivity. It doesn't look like just saying, well, I guess that's the way things are. Let me read you a little bit about what faithful ministry looks like. Also from the letters of Paul, this from the second letter to the church at Corinth. But we have this treasure, good news of the gospel, in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power, did you know that? That the gospel is extraordinary power? That this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. Here's the reality, though. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed always 
carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our bodies. It is true that the success of the church does not look like American corporate success. That's true. Being faithful does not guarantee that we will have full pews and overflowing coffers of money. But make no mistake, God has not called us to passivity. God has not called us to simply sit on a pew whenever it is convenient and sort of twiddle our thumbs and whistle in the dark until the end comes. I reject that. We are called to be faithful. And while the success of the church may not look like the success of culture, we can be witnesses to the victory of resurrection over a culture of sin and death. Let me tell you a story about faithfulness. You see, we're, if, if you're on our mailing list, You've already gotten it. You got a little love note this week. An envelope full of things. A wonderful letter from our senior warden, as well as all the things you need to know about making a pledge. About participating financially in the life of this community. About how through each of our own commitment to this place, we ensure that it remains faithful to the gospel. So here's the story about faithfulness. There was a member of the 8 o'clock congregation. Her name is Pat Bischoff. Pat, so Steve and Sarah, raise your hands. So Pat sat on the pew right ahead of Steve and Sarah. It has not gone without notice for me today that in both services, no one was sitting in Pat's pew and she's been gone since 2011. Pat sat in that pew. Pat was a faithful member of this congregation. She did all the things. When I came to know her, she was a faithful member of the Daughters of the King. She was regular at the Wednesday morning and the Friday morning Eucharist. She was regular at church. She gave. She worked. She participated. And those of you who might remember her, Pat could be a little cranky. But she was a part of this congregation. And in 2011, as her life began to wind down, and we all knew what the end would be. One day, I was visiting Pat in the hospital room with her two sons, and Pat pronounced from her hospital bed that she wanted to donate a stained glass window in her memory. The boys looked at me like, So Pat passed on, we had her funeral, and we began to try and figure out how we might make this dream, this desire of this faithful lady come to pass. And so Pat's wish became a project for Pat's faith community. First thing we notice is uh, we don't have any more room in here for a stained glass window. And so we began to search for a way to accommodate that request. Oh, and the other thing was, was that Pat's estate was modest, and while she was generous, we weren't sure how we were even going to afford a stained glass window. One day, as a number of us were wandering around trying to figure out where such a stained glass window would go if we could even one, we happened to see that in the parish library, at the top of a center set of bookshelves, there was an empty space. 
And the parish library is often used, for those of you who have not been here for funerals, it is often used as the place where the casket is placed and where family members greet friends and loved ones ahead of a funeral. And so I don't know exactly who hatched the idea, but the idea was hatched. Why can't we put a stained glass window here? And so Bill Robinson went out and tracked down the stained glass window people who designed the Beatitude windows. And Bill crafted a design for the stained glass. We sent it out, got it made. But because the stained glass window was going to be inside, half the beauty of the stained glass is by having light pass through it. And it wasn't going to get light to pass through it sitting on a bookshelf. And Steve Poser wired it so that there would be light through that stained glass. And then, miracle of miracles, owing to the fact that Episcopalians can never bear to throw anything away, John Gnorski, who was our junior warden at the time, goes searching through the garage next door to where 1717 Church Street used to be, or 1715, whatever it was. He goes searching through the garage, and would you know, he finds wood that is in the exact sort that those bookcases were constructed John made the frame for the stained glass window. This faithful person who had this faithful desire to leave something of beauty for a church that had nurtured her through the years, in good times and bad, through the death of her husband, through the challenges that she had faced in her health, through all those things, this church surrounded her when she had her good days and when she had her cranky days, this church surrounded her. The stained glass window is in the library. And the words on the stained glass window, I have fought the good fight. I'd encourage you when you leave this morning, there's another reason to take a left and you'll hear that at the announcements, but when you leave this morning, take a minute. Peer into the library. I've made sure that the light's on. And give thanks, even if you never met Pat Bishop, give thanks for the life of Pat Bishop and her witness to the faithfulness of Christ. Give thanks for this parish community that finds ways of being faithful to someone's desire even when that way seems a little bit out of the ordinary. Give thanks for the fact that for 135 years, this place has been a witness to the life and ministry and resurrection of Jesus. We've not always been dramatic. We've not always been happy, but through the decades, we have always been faithful. I pray that faithfulness will continue, and I believe that through that faithfulness, we will indeed find the success that God has granted for us to find. standing. Let us affirm the articles of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 355, 358, pardon me. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty.
pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are our own. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, and justice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek to hear. For Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, and for Jeff, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God and His church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially for Brody. Dawn, Kaylee, Paul, Ian, Sandy, Barb, Lynn, Julia, Betty, Kent, Dan, Greg, Ann, Patty, Lynn, Alice, Angie, Rebecca, Jeff, Ellen, Denise, Colleen, Mary, Jan, Joe, Brian, Jack, Barb, Brian, Jess, Kevin, Connor, and Keely. Hear us, Lord. Parishioners celebrating birthdays, especially John, Max, Jack, Fred, and Jackie. And for those celebrating anniversaries, especially David and Sharon. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so hold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. You may be seated. Lots of uh, announcements. I'll try to be quick. Uh, first of all, thank you to all of you who turned out yesterday for the parish work day and uh, all of your raking, um, chipping, chopping, sweeping, all of that. It's most appreciated. And if you missed out on the fun yesterday but would like to have some fun today, there is probably an opportunity. So Bob Love, raise your hand. Bob Love, our Buildings and Grounds Chair, will be uh, looking uh, thankful and expectant in the Narthex after, after service. So if you would like to uh, participate in further efforts here, uh, Bob can hook you up. 
This is the last day to turn in items for the awesome auction. I'll wave this orange sheet around. You've seen it for a couple of weeks. Read, mark, learn, inwardly digest uh, awesome auction on November the 5th. A word that Scott Stoner and I will be leading our second retreat on two feet uh, at Scuppernong Trails. You can find that information about that in the bulletin and also in our e-news. Speaking of e-news, if you have received the parish e-news but you have not opened it, no shame. But if you have not opened it, you've missed a treat. So go home, not in your mobile device here, but go home. Maybe to the parking lot. Open the e-news. At the top of the e-news, there is an announcement about a visit that we are anticipating from our Bishop Provisional, Jeffrey Lee, the Bishop of Milwaukee. And Jeff has recorded a little uh, video to greet us in anticipation of coming here. And uh, I'm not going to spoil the surprise, but you will find if you watch that video that Jeff has a history with this congregation. Uh, and if you want to know more about that history, see Barb Thompson after the service because Bob's got a Jeff Lee story to tell. There are cookies for sale, and not just any cookies. These are magnificent works of art cookies. These are cookies of such quality and magnitude that one might hesitate to even eat them. But we are selling cookies in the narthex, which is the room between here and the doors. Take a left. On your way to see the library window for Pat Bischoff, make a trip across the narthex and buy uh, cookies for this particular outreach uh, fundraising effort. I will be away from mid-afternoon tomorrow until Wednesday at noon. I leave Wednesday at noon. There is a mandatory clergy conference in at Holy Wisdom Monastery uh, just outside of Madison. This will include clergy from the Diocese of Milwaukee, Fond du Lac, and Eau Claire as these three clergy bodies get together um, to talk about what the future might hold for these three dioceses. Pray for us all anytime clergy are together for longer than 24 hours. It can get a little dicey. Uh, but we will, uh, I will be back in the office uh, Wednesday afternoon. Do we have birthdays or anniversaries that we're celebrating this week? We can bless Dave in absentia. Let us pray. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servant John as he begins another year. Grant that he may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen his trust in your goodness all the days of his life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O oh God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send therefore your blessing upon your servants Dave and Sharon, that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience and wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Happy anniversary. Happy birthday. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Our liturgy continues with Eucharistic Prayer A on page 361. You may stand or remain seated as you are comfortable. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of After supper, he took a cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, Lord,
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Our post-communion prayer is found on page 365. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. We would like to invite you to sing our closing song, which you'll find in the bulletin today on the last page. Uh, and as a reminder, uh, we're inviting everyone to sing on verses one and four, but women to sing on, on verse two, and men to sing on verse three. We'll all sing the refrain together, which is the last couple of lines. My heart shall sing. Spirit sings of the wondrous things that you bring. 
quoting John Lewis today. Freedom is not a state. It is an act. It is not some enchanted garden perched on a distant plateau where we can finally sit down and rest. Freedom is a continuous action we must all take, and each generation must do its part to create an even more fair, more just society. Let us go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you.